So, whenever a verse or a sermon starts with so, it means it's based on what went before. And our reading started with a so. We're up to verse 16 in 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, which starts so. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Well, why is that so, is the obvious question. Paul has just said in the previous verse that as Christians, we are to live for Christ, not for ourselves. He is my Lord, not my own desires and wishes, but his. So I want to view people in the same way that Jesus does. And as Christians, we seek to look at people and events from a new point of view, not a worldly one. And that's what Paul says. We don't regard anyone in a worldly way or according to the flesh, if you're used to reading a an earlier version of the Bible. The flesh there just means point of view of someone who doesn't have God in their life, a worldly point of view. And indeed, Paul himself, when he was Saul, used to hate Christians, seeking them out to imprison them and approving of stoning them to death. But in that transformative encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus Road, Paul's eyes were open to Christ's love and a whole new world of spiritual realities came to understand. He came to see things very differently. He had a completely new perspective, a spiritual point of view, not a worldly point of view. And for us, it raises a very simple question. How do I view people? Do I see them from a worldly point of view as, as rivals or, or competitors, people to get ahead of in the queue? People I have to overcome, get things my way. Or are they people like me? Do I see them in a new way as people like me who's been called by our loving Father to live in his kingdom? Some of whom, hopefully many of you here, have already responded to that call. And my view of others is that I long to see them respond, enter God's kingdom. How do I view other people? Well, in the next verse, we, we have not just a so that we have to look back for, but we have a therefore. Paul making it difficult for the reader to have to keep looking back, calling what he said already. <laughs> therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Well, we need to think back two weeks, really, to the start of chapter five, those of you who are here. Where Paul explains that as Christians, we look forward to a new resurrection body and a future home with God in glory. We look forward to something very different from what we experience now. 
something wonderful and, and perfect that we can hardly even imagine. But right now, we have God's Holy Spirit given to us as almost a first instalment, a deposit. Something that says, this is just the start. You've got something special now, but there's loads more still to come, and this is an assurance of it. Therefore, Paul says, and literally in the, in the original Greek it reads, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. They may look the same as when they were not a believer. But there's now a fundamental difference. They have a new Lord, a new life. They are, as Jesus himself put it, born again. With a new hope for the future. We've just been celebrating in song that difference. That those of us who put our trust in Christ really are new creations. Because for every single believer, God has acted decisively. He's renewed me by his spirit and begun that process, putting everything right. Now, of course, it's a process that's going to go on for the rest of my life. We read in Colossians chapter 3 from Verse 9, about this new self, Paul says, do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. That new self is being daily renewed by God. Because my old way of seeing things, my old self-centered way of life hasn't entirely disappeared in my heart. And I'm sure you all have that experience too. We know that struggle between the promptings of the spirit and our conscience and our own worldly desires. Because each of us are still imperfect human beings who daily fall far short of what I know I should be. God's promise is that we are being renewed daily in that new self. The new self is there. So don't feel you're a failure because you're acutely aware of your own failings. On the contrary, that's a sign that the Spirit of God is at work in your heart, illuminating it. And it's calls not for despair and, and condemnation of yourself. It calls for repentance and grace, and that's what God offers. So where does this new life come from? And in verse 18, Paul says, all this is from God. Reconciled us himself through Christ. Of course it comes from God, because I can't put myself right with God. I can't bear myself in you. I can't be born again by my own efforts. I need God to enter into my life to do that. God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. People who are enemies need reconciling. Bring them back into fellowship to make them friends again. Reconciliation is a word that talks about enemies becoming friends. Paul uses that word five times in the next four verses. And what a desperate need 
our world has for reconciliation, for enemies to become friends. We pray for it. We see it on a national scale between Ukraine and Russia, between Palestinian and Israeli, but also on an individual level in our own communities, families, and relationships. God's reconciliation acts on all levels. Just earlier on in, in Colossians, Paul says this, talking about Christ, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Reconciliation was fruit of Christ's great work of salvation. And it means enemies becoming friends, fear and hatred being replaced by trust and goodwill. And it has to be based on forgiveness. In South Africa, after the fall of apartheid, Bishop Desmond Tutu led a commission it was called Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And it was a hard time for many to hear what had been done and to find in their hearts of forgiveness to achieve reconciliation. Of course, it wasn't perfect, but it was substantial, an example of Christ-likeness for the rest of the world to see. And reconciliation is at the heart of the glorious good news of the gospel. The proclamation, as we've just heard, God has reconciled the world, individuals, sinful people, to himself in and through Jesus Christ. This is the very basis of Paul's message and his ministry. How is this achieved? How can this be? How did God reconcile all things to himself? But in verse 19, we read, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Well, does that mean God's just saying sin doesn't really matter? I won't count it against you. I won't count it anymore. We get the final answer, the final peak of, of Paul's explanation in verse 21, where he says, God made him, Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Some translations prefer God made him who had no sin to be a sin offering for us. The meaning is the same. We're on holy ground here in the very heart of the Christian gospel of God's great work of redemption. Sending his own son into the world. Giving him up to be made sin. Part of what we see happening on the cross, that wonderful sacrifice that Jesus made, a sin offering sufficient for the sins of the whole world. That's what we've been celebrating at Easter recently. And this is the central mystery and glory of the Christian faith. That's why our symbol supremely is the cross. Jesus taking my place and your place, bearing the condemnation, the suffering. So we were seeing even the wrath of God 
against all that is wrong and sinful and unholy. Doing it so that in him, as we put our trust in him, as we give up our own efforts to please God, as we repent, place ourselves into Christ's hands, we are forgiven, reconciled to God, made, made pure in his sight, made fit to be part of his family, able to know him as the loving father that he is. Now, usually in reconciliation, it takes two parties to come together because they're, they're equals of two different people. But we're not God's equals. So it needed God to take the initiative. And that's exactly what he's done. He has reconciled the world to himself, but it needs each individual within that world to accept that reconciliation, to make it a reality in their lives, become that new creation they could and should be. Needs a response. So Paul didn't want the Corinthians, and I'm sure he wouldn't want us, to just sit around praising God and, and delighting in his reconciling love. I mean, yes, we should do that, and we do. But we also want to share this glorious news. We invite and urge and implore other people to be reconciled to God. And of course, this means telling them that they need to be reconciled. That they, at the moment, are enemies to God. And that's often not a popular message. It's not something people want to hear. Our society encourages people to build up their own self-esteem, see themselves as, as deserving good things. So the message that you're separated from God, and however hard you try, however good you are, you cannot, through your own efforts, make yourself worthy to stand in his presence, to stand in the presence of a a blazingly pure and holy God. Well, it's often not what people want to hear. To appreciate the good news of the gospel, you need to be aware of the bad news that goes before it. But when the Spirit of God is at work in someone's heart, bringing them to see their true situation before God, then they can be ready to grasp the Saviour's outstretched hand, to repent, to put aside all human pride and merit and efforts, and trust solely in the risen Christ, the Saviour and Lord. And if you're here this morning listening, and you're not a Christian, quite simply as Paul did, I implore you, be reconciled to God. And if you're not yet ready to take that step of faith, then spend more time with God's ambassadors. Because those of us who are Christians are all given the privilege and the responsibility of having the message of reconciliation, the gospel, committed to us and of being God's ambassadors a hurting world. And we've already heard how people judge God's church, God's kingdom, on how his ambassadors behave, what they do. Are we showing the love of God in the different situations of our lives? Life can be really difficult at times. God doesn't promise us as his ambassadors an easy time just swanning around to parties and, and having a nice time necessarily. 
We're not promised lives free of heartache or suffering. And indeed, sometimes it can even feel like God is our enemy. Plenty of times in the Psalms where the psalmist expresses those feelings. Because everything isn't perfect yet. We're called to walk by faith, not by sight, because we don't see everything restored. We don't see everything reconciled to God. That's for the next world. We walk by faith, by faith in a crucified Saviour and a risen Lord. One who we can be sure keeps his promises. But whatever it may feel like right now, his spirit is at work in our hearts. We have been born again. We are new creations in Christ. But it's only in Christ. And it's at the foot of the cross that we can be assured of God's love. So let's pray and live and work for that reconciliation to be evident in our lives, in our relationships, in our communities. Really, it's what we call revival. It's what we long for, to see the Lord at work and glorified in hearts and lives and minds. And let's open our hearts to be the start of that process, to be renewed by his spirit. Close with a prayer. Holy God, we thank you that you gave your son to be made sin for us sinners. Lord, we are in awe of your love and your grace. We are thankful to you. And we pray that that same love might be shed abroad through us your ambassadors you might be glorified and that the world might see that you are a reconciling god and know your love in jesus name we ask amen